let's read from um, our theme scripture for the conference, Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. The heart of serving is our theme. The heart of serving. Can you turn to your neighbor and say the heart of serving? The heart of serving. Okay, Matthew 20, 28. I'll say that again. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28. Amen. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. May God bless the reading of his word. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I want to talk to you about something that you have to have a heart of serving. You have to have this. It's at the core of who we are as Faith in God Ministries. I want to talk about the power of soul winning. Hallelujah. Amen. There's a lot of things that we can, we can do. There's a lot of things that we can emphasize on. But one thing that we, I believe, is at the core of our calling as God's children is for us to win souls. Hallelujah. Amen. And here I wrote, I said, yes, soul winning is a crucial aspect of Christian ministry, emphasizing the importance of sharing the gospel and leading people to faith in Jesus Christ. And I've written down five, five points to emphasize the power of soul winning. Five. And I want to encourage you that right now it might be, we might look at ourselves and say we, we are few as a district, we are few as, as, as churches. But the power of soul winning says that when you understand it, that your calling is to engulf not just where your community, your calling to engulf not just the province of Gauteng or not just the nation of South Africa, but nations of the world, engulf them with the gospel of the kingdom of God. If you begin to understand that, then that will open a lot of doorways for you. Hallelujah. So one of the things that you, if you begin to understand uh, that the importance of soul winning, this happens when you begin to have an emphasis of telling others about Christ. Number one, it fulfills a purpose-driven life. Hallelujah. A purpose-driven life. It's amazing how many of us just live without purpose, even as children of God. If I'm to ask some of you in this place, why are you here on earth? If I'm to ask some of you, most would stammer, most would not be able to really you know, give me a straightforward answer. What is your purpose? Why are you here on earth? But now if you understand the power of soul winning, if you begin to understand telling others about Jesus Christ, this you'll be able to answer. Your purpose in life. You begin to live a purpose-driven life. Hallelujah. So there, there are two, the two greats in the word of God. There's the great commandment and the great commission. These commands were, begin, were given by Christ. Okay, let's look at the, the great commandment. He says, love. Love God. Love your neighbor and love your enemy. It's just love. Hallelujah. He says to them, love the Lord your God. Matthew chapter 22 verse 37. Matthew 22 verse 37. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And with all your mind, this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. As the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Okay, it's true, but you see I've added the third one. It's still the same with the second one. Love your neighbor. Because as the enemy, the one that we call enemy, as, as they become your neighbor, you have no choice but to love them. Who is your neighbor? Neighbor is anybody who is in need. And... If you have the resources to help, go on and help. Hallelujah. Amen. So even your enemy can become your neighbor at one point. And then if they are in need of anything, this is the gospel that we preach. That for me, this is what I've, my resolution in life, that I have no enemies. This, that's me. I've just resolved that I have no enemies. If there are people out there who hate me, so, so be it. But I don't ha hate anybody. Why? Because the love of Christ compels me to love everybody, even my enemies. So how do you love your enemies? Some people cannot be able to answer that. Your enemy, those who are your enemies who hate you and they do nasty things, they hurt you. 
when they are in need, when they are in need, you don't revenge. You use your resources to help them out of their, their misery. Hallelujah. You heap cause of love on them. That's how you love your enemies. So at the end of the day, if you look in the same way that I see life, you see that you might also not have enemies. Because whether they are your friend, you love them. Whether they are your enemy, you love them. There's no difference. You just love everybody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So you will see that love is what makes the world go round. It is love. So the first commandment is love. So your purpose is being defined now. If you begin to understand so winning, that if you love your neighbor, like yourself, if you love even your enemy, you see that soul winning is the answer. It will give you purpose in life. Hallelujah. Amen. Then number two, the Great Commission. The Great Commission says, go and make disciples of all nations. Maybe 28, verse 18. Go and make disciples of all nations. He says to them, all oh, authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So there is the great commandment, the great commission rather, where we've been commissioned to go into the world. Nations. When we speak of nations, we're speaking of different people from different tribes. Might not be like South Africa as a nation, might actually be uh, languages and tribes of people. The Zulu nation, the Sutu nation. Let's go and make disciples of everybody. We tell them, you know, I, you know, did this year. At one time, I was asking him about Mexico. He said, "What type of people Mexicans are?" He says, "No, the, the, you know, people are just different on the on the skin color. But the Mexicans are, are like us. They they also go out there and do these ancestral things. They need redemption. They need Christ. Don't be afraid of anybody." They, they need Christ. Be them colored, be them white, be them Chinese. They are, we are all the same, just the color of the skin. We need Jesus Christ. So if you make it a mandate in your life to tell others, even your bosses at work, because that's the command of Christ, he says, go and make disciples of everyone in season and out of season. Hallelujah. So I want to encourage you. Sometimes you're filled with fear. Sometimes we're filled. I want to encourage you in this way. South Africa, we got, a lot of people got different perceptions about South Africa. But do you know that when the president of South Africa is addressing the nation, he does not speak in Sizulu. What language does he speak in? If you're like me, who is in the, in the, in the marketplace, you'll be surprised how many people in South Africa understand English. I work with them. We discuss the, when the president speaks on, like, in the evening, the next day we're talking about it, and everybody is well versed with what the president said. He spoke in English. South Africans understand English. That's no excuse, I'm telling you. The most important pronouncements in South Africa, they are made in English, and people know and understand. So English is our medium of communication, even in South Africa. Don't be afraid. Speak your English. Tell them about Jesus in English. Some of the most prominent business people in South Africa are Nigerians. And Nigerians, they don't speak a word of any South African language. Yeah. One day I had the privilege of meeting one Nigerian guy. <laughs> and he was, uh, he was communicating with this Zulu guy. You know, that was a, a clash, a serious clash. The Zulus are proud of their language. They speak in Sizu, no matter who you are. They speak in Sizu. And the Nigerian, he was speaking English. And then the Zulu guy came to him and said, start to speak to him in Sizu. And just, loudly, he says, hey man, speak in English. Can't you speak in English? <laughs> <laughs> and the, he, he, he said that with so much authority and power. So that the, the Zulu guy had to change and speak in English. So, let's not be afraid of telling others about Christ in South Africa. These guys can understand English. Yeah. If you cannot speak issues with you, when you can kuluma, you can teta, use English. What language do they speak in when they're at the marketplace? They speak English with their bosses. Hallelujah. So the, the commandment that we have is to tell others about Jesus. So if you then run with the vision of faith in God ministries, engulfing the world, you find your purpose in life. Some of you don't know it, but let me tell you. Simple. 
if you just tell others about Christ, if you make it your mission in life, just telling your neighbors, your relatives, your brothers and sisters, just simply telling them about Christ, what Christ has done, simple that you fulfilled your purpose in life, the basics of purpose in life. Hallelujah. Amen. Number two, the power of soul winning. As we have a heart to serve, a heart to, tell somebody, say, have a heart to serve. I didn't hear everybody say that. Everybody said, have a heart to serve. So you serve by winning souls. You serve by winning souls. So number two, personal growth. Personal growth. That's the power of soul winning. You grow as a, as, as, as a Christian. You grow. There's no other way if you want to grow personally, spiritually. A catalyst is available for all of us if we begin to tell others about Jesus. Hallelujah. So engaging in soul winning can lead to personal spiritual growth as it depends one's understanding of the gospel and faith. I've written here uh, uh, and a good example from the word of God in Acts chapter 18 verse 24. Let's go there. Acts 18 verse 24. Acts 18 verse 24. The story of Apollos and Priscilla and Aquila. Meanwhile, a Jew, this guy was a Jew, named Apollos, very eloquent, this guy was something else, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. This is where Aquila and Priscilla were. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. I want you to note this, that Apollos was no ordinary Jew. He had a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. That means he knew the Old Testament in and out, and he knew enough about Christ to be able to go out there and teach about Christ. Are you there with me? Amen. By then, they didn't have the New Testament as we know it. But he knew enough. He was so learned that he had, they had to, the writer to, 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 in the, the, of the book of Acts had to say that, that this man was learned. And the third, others, he says he was eloquent. Verse 20 Five says he had been instructed in the way of the Lord and he spoke with great favor and taught about Jesus accurately although he knew only about the baptism of John he began to speak boldly in the synagogue when Priscilla and Aquila heard him they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of the Lord more adequately hallelujah so let's look at this this is he represents a lot of us we got a good understanding of the scriptures. We know enough about Christ Jesus. But we have a lot to learn like our followers. So it took Priscilla and Aquila with a lot of wisdom, had him in the synagogue, preaching the gospel, and they realized that this man, yes, highly learned, but there are a lot of areas that he needed to learn. Set him down. And then they taught him about Christ in a more adequate manner. Hallelujah. So let's look at the results now. Apollos now has been schooled by Priscilla and Aquila. Why? Because he, you know, the, 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 the foundation that I want you to understand here is how was he able to be taught is because he was preaching Jesus Christ. He was sharing the gospel. Amen. That's how he was discovered. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So then he was equipped now. Verse 27. When Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. So he then went to another location. When he arrived, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed. Verse 28. For the, they vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. Hallelujah. So here now, Apollos moved to another area where people really knew the scriptures better than he used to do. But now because he was better equipped, he had grown in the knowledge of Christ, he was able then to stand and defend the gospel with more vigor, with more confidence, with more zest. He was more bold. Why? Because of the lessons that he learned from Priscilla and Aquila. Where did he come from? From where he was active preaching the gospel. Hallelujah. So if you want to grow spiritually, you need to be somebody who is active in the marketplace. It's your school. 
with your neighbors. You need to be telling people constantly. And then they'll ask you questions you cannot answer. Then you run to your elder, you run to your FF leader, you run to your pastor. You ask them. They will tell you, they will show you in a more adequate manner. Then you go back and tell them, I have the answer, here it is. Hallelujah. By the time that you go for three months, six months after a year, you are growing spiritually. You are growing in the knowledge of Christ. Hallelujah. So, so winning, the power of so winning as you serve in the house of the Lord is that it will help you grow. It will force you to grow. You don't know everything. Hallelujah. There was at one time with, uh, with uh, I used to love ministering with the arrow kids. I've since stopped there. Uh, I've got the love for the arrow kids. Those who know me, you know I love arrow kids. But yeah, they need, you need a special grace to be able to minister to those guys. <laughs> And now one raises their hand. I'm busy now, you know, I'm, I'm teaching them. One raises their hand. Hey, ask your question. You're, you're teaching them. They, they don't stop for you to finish. Eh? They just raise. <laughs> ask your question. Yes, yes, pastor, pastor. Ah, uh, what? Who created God? <laughs> and you're talking to this four-year, five-year-old. Yeah. I, I, I want to tell you, I struggled to answer that question so that they can understand. I struggled. I know from the, 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 the theory that we know from, 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 from Bible school, from apologetics, it's very simple. I can, to guys who are mature, who are older, it's simple, ga, 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 I'm done. But with these little ones, I really struggled. So you, you get to have these baby questions from adults. Are you hearing me? Amen. I was asked from, by an adult this time, why did God create Satan? If Satan is so evil, why did God create him? I can ask the same question here. Yeah. And a lot of you mumble and struggle to answer that question. But these kind of questions, they seem silly. But these are the things that they ask us out there. Then you go and do your research and you come and answer. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. So it will help you to grow spiritually. You will definitely grow. Okay, let's go to the, last, the, the next one, the, the third one. As you serve the Lord, as you have a heart to serve, I want you to begin to understand that there are certain gifts that attract people to church, certain gifts, and we're seeing that. Some of the biggest churches that we have, even here in South Africa, in Nigeria, we've got some of the largest gatherings that I've ever seen. In Zimbabwe, there are churches that are being pastored by prophets. You agree with me? Yeah. People are following the gift. So there are gifts that naturally just attract people. Naturally. And sometimes if you watch some of this, I've watched some of the Nigerian churches. Yo! Yeah. You will see that the power of the prophetic ministry is something else. The gospel is not preached there. People just want to be, to be prophesied and things happen. Hallelujah. Are you with me? But not everyone of us have been gifted with this gift, the prophetic gift. Not everybody of us would then make people stand out of wheelchairs because people would flock. If we start doing it, will people rising out of wheelchairs, the blind seeing, we would have space to contain the people. But how many of us have that gift? Are you hearing me? But there's a way out of it. There's a way. When you begin to win souls, you feel churches. Hallelujah. When you have a mandate to go out there and the minister, I've got a, a sister-in-law, so to speak. She goes to another, another church. I won't mention it though, but... Uh, she challenged us. She challenged me and my wife. We went to Durban to visit her, and then she began to tell us a story. Uh, then she was not working, uh, and she woke up in the morning, like everybody of us. She woke up in the morning, prepared kids, sent the kids to school, the husband to work, and she bought this, as if she's going to work, with a handbag, a little Bible, and uh, some, some, some brushes, and she goes into the street. She will have a, a lunch break. <laughs> She will have a lunch break. 
Go back home, eat, go back on the streets. You know what she was doing in the street? Preaching, sharing the gospel. And the place that she was, KZN of all places, and she couldn't even speak in Zulu. She would speak English. And she would win, she would say she would minister to about uh, maybe 10, 15 people who give her a chance throughout the day. Then about half of them will receive Christ. And to church, maybe two or three would come to church on Sunday. Every day, every week, she would go and minister in the streets. And the church, the church was growing. By then, when we met her, it had over a thousand people in that church. And she was very instrumental in growing that church. Yeah. What gift did she have? Not any, any, any gift. Yeah. She, she never used even to, to pray for anybody in the streets. Yeah. Nobody who was blind saw. She never prophesied to anybody, just telling them about Christ and inviting them to come to church on Sunday. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. She's still there in KZN. Powerful woman of God. Ordinary, like you and me. And she goes in the streets of KZN in Devon, speaking English. <laughs> My brother, can I just talk to you? What do you want? What do you want? Let me talk to you about Christ. Now, of course, you learn your tricks. One thing that you deal with the Zulu-speaking people is that you greet them in Zulu. First, then you go with your English. You are done. Hallelujah, somebody. Amen. Am I talking to somebody? Amen. So now church growth comes from us knowing the importance of soul winning. You and me have been equipped, have been given the grace, the anointing is upon us to tell others about Christ. He has been released. All we need to do is obey. So the power of soul winning is we will grow our church. Our churches would grow definitely. As new believers come into our church, they become part of the family, and then they contribute to its vitality, like we've been taught. We call it new wine skins. We need new wine skins for the church to go. Hallelujah. For the church to go and the church to grow. And you see that these new believers contribute to building God's kingdom and expanding his reign in our hearts and in our lives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you are blessed with a power gift, we praise the Lord. We praise the Lord. And that we use it for the glory of God. But if not, it's no excuse. We still have to to preach, we were the some time back. We went into the streets, um, maybe a couple of months. We we were in the, our month of soul winning. We did it for a couple of months, and uh, we were going into the streets in in Jobek. I, I I had not really experienced that. What we used to do is we go to the park when we were at Jobek Park. We'd go into Jobek Park and just people were sitting. That's what we used to do, but not really go into the streets and then. Uh, and then approach individuals who are going wherever they are going, and then you stop them, you talk to them, and invite them to come to church. If I have been able to experience the level of resistance that I received in the streets of Johannesburg, I will tell you this year it was something else. The level of resistance, people don't want to hear nothing about church. But out of that would, would continue. I would encourage the team that I was working with, let's carry on. And then one time we stopped this group of people. We then managed to lead them to receive Christ. And then the following week, we took their numbers, we followed up. English, we, we couldn't but notice it. But how come these young people in this, some of them were a little bit older, they're so eloquent in their English. And he says, you know what, Pastor? You don't know what we've been through. We'll sit down one day and we'll talk. But then we were feeding them in the streets. And it's a ministry that we are pushing. That we want to talk to these people and bring them to Christ. You may never know. They may appear to be, today they are drug addicts and wasted and useless. But tomorrow they might be your big shark. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Tomorrow they may be the evangelist, the prophet. Amen. Who's going to bring and you'll be the father or the mother of that person. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Imagine they are, they are in a stadium now. They're ministering to thousands powerful evangelist and you're seated there and he, they give honor to you. Were it not for my father, Shepherd Marufu, I would not be here. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. What joy. Yeah. So, 
soul winning, the power of soul winning, you never know the seeds that you're planting and the people who are receiving them and what they'll be tomorrow. Let's be encouraged. Let's be encouraged. Not only would our churches grow. So how much time am I left now? So that I don't get carried away. Fifteen, thank you. Thank you. All right. So let's just quickly go to the scriptures. I want to show you something there. How so winning is you serving the Lord with your heart. How it makes the church grow. Acts chapter 11 verse 19. Acts 11 verse 19. It says, Meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch of Syria. Um, so I, I want to thank God for our father who then during time of tribulation and uh, uncertainty in the nation of South Africa, a lot of people were considered coming back, going back home. And uh, through a word, which we believe was a prophetic word, he says, don't go anywhere. There are some people who went home, who didn't listen. We stood in the churches and told them, don't go anywhere. And they insisted, they went. And do you know where they are now? They're back here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you would see that there's a way that God uses because of his love for us. You yeah. cause suffering yeah. in a God-loving nation yeah. for people to scatter. As they're scattering, they are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. So yes, you might feel we are here for green pastures. Yeah, yeah okay, that's, that's fine. Yeah. But you must know your purpose. Your purpose here is to engulf South Africa with the gospel of the kingdom of God. To preach Jesus Christ, he who was crucified, he who died on the cross, buried for three days, and rose again from the dead. Now he's seated at the right hand side of the Father in heaven. It is he, only him, that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. And if we confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts, we shall be saved. So this scattering here is for a purpose, and it happened. So as they were being scattered, they preached the word of God, but only to Jews. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. The power of the Lord was with them, and a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. So every time that you speak the gospel, there are some people who believe. Yeah. I remember one time I was with my wife, there was a sermon that was preached. A sermon that was preached. After the sermon, we, we had not received anything during that sermon. If you remember a young man called Joel, if you remember, ma'am, Joel, that's enough. <laughs> we got a Joel here, it's not you, son. Joel, long back. Uh, that, 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 that sermon, it was for us, it was, and the majority of the church, it was, it was, it was very dry dry bones. Then out of the service we meet this young man Joel and he's smiling ear to ear and he is excited and for him this was the message of his life and that message transformed him totally. I'm telling you, believe you me. Believe you me. And Joel would walk from um, where the place where the VID, Eastley. He would walk from Eastley coming to church and after that sermon, he would come every Sunday walking to church, long distances. He would come from Eastley all the way across to Belvedere. Those who know the place, you know the distance I'm talking about. So no matter how drunken your sermon might be, somebody will receive something. You will never know. You might be stuttering or stammering. It does not matter. It is not your power. It is not you. But it is the power of the word. So you, in obedience, there is power in the word of God. In obedience, just tell others about Christ. Tell them you are doing your part. That's your heart to serve. You are serving. Hallelujah. You see here, these guys, they moved in the power of God. And a large number of Gentiles believed. Why? Because in obedience, they moved. So verse 22, when the church of Jerusalem heard what had happened, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. 
when he arrived and saw the evidence of God's blessings, he was filled with joy and encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit, strong in faith, and many people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. Both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. So as the church was, as people were scattering, it was not just for the preachers, the teachers, it was for everybody. They went out there and they were in obedience teaching. And Gentiles who had no idea about Christ, no idea about the Jewish religion, they were turning and believing to Christ. Hallelujah. Then something then happened along the way. Barnabas then saw what was God was doing. Then he went and then took Saul. He was named Saul then. And then they spent a whole full year at Antioch. And it is at this place that we hear for the first time the word Christian, Christ-like. Hallelujah. How do people become to be Christ-like? By people like you and me preaching the good news. Hallelujah. In its simplicity, preaching the good news. 